welcome to Ask Dr. Guy or Live, wherever you're watching. Hope you're making today your masterpiece. Welcome on this Friday afternoon to the one place, the one time that I answer orthopedic questions, health and wellness questions, whatever it is you have. Very excited to be here. My name is Dr. David Geyer, triple board certified orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and anti-aging and regenerative medicine expert. I help you feel, look, and perform your best regardless of age or injuries. As always, please remember I cannot give specific medical advice on this show. I can address topics, answer topics, or at least give my thoughts on those topics, uh, but I have not seen you. I haven't examined you. I haven't looked at x-rays, MRIs, anything like that. So what I am saying is in no way medical advice. No doctor can give you medical advice online, at least if you're not in that st the state where he or she has a medical license. So this is not medical advice, but hopefully this gives you information that then you can take to your orthopedic surgeon and say, well, hey, what about this? Or if your orthopedics, you've already seen your orthopedic surgeon and he or she gave you information and you didn't understand it, hopefully this will allow that to make more sense maybe. Or maybe you'll get ideas, things you didn't ask about. Also, I would love if you're watching on YouTube, a couple things. One, please enter your questions if you have any in the chat, not in the comments. I cannot see the comments. I can only see the questions or the the. Uh, questions in the chats are all that are sent to me. Also, I would love it if you'd subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm rapidly approaching 100,000 followers or subscribers, which is amazing and I'm extremely, extremely grateful. But a number of people more than anything are wanting to know if I get anything from YouTube if I get to 100,000. So we will see soon. Most people seem to think there's some sort of silver plaque that I'm going to be getting, but we will soon see. All right, let me start. And as always, I will stay as long as there's questions, which, which can be 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It can be as quick as a, you know, five or minutes or less, depending on how many questions there are. All right, first one is from James. This one was left even before we started, so I want to start there. I was just wondering if running after OCD surgery in the knee increases the risk of developing arthritis in the future, even if one has been running pain-free. All right, that is a great question. Before I address possibility of arthritis, let me explain to everybody else what OCD of the knee is. It stands for osteochondritis desiccans. It's a condition, usually it starts in early teenage years, more often in boys than in girls, but it can linger and become a problem in adults. Uh, you don't usually see it first diagnosed in adults because it's usually become a problem before that. The child has not even gone through pu puberty or it just did, but anyway. An area of bone and cartilage in the knee separates from the un the rest of the bone and cartilage. Now, early on, especially in kids that haven't been done growing, that lesion may still sit in place. And again, if they're 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, you can make them non-weight bearing for six or eight weeks or more. And sometimes that works to allow that area of bone and cartilage to heal to the rest of the bone and cartilage. That doesn't work all that often. What happens, and this is definitely true once you have finished growing, that piece of bone and cartilage will eventually break off. Um, now, if it's still sitting in the right place, you can hold it in place with screws or a variety of other devices. If it starts to come out, that's very hard to repair. And you're usually talking about about a surgery to replace that cylinder of bone and cartilage with a plug of cylinder, a plug or a cylinder of bone and cartilage, either from another part of the knee, maybe the non-weight bearing part of the um, trochlear groove, or if it's a very big piece, and I used to do these surgeries a lot, you take a big cylinder of bone and cartilage from a donor, somebody that's died, they harvested their organs, and you transplant that cylinder of bone and cartilage into the knee. Now, generally, if you do nothing, that that OCD lesion is broken free, you do nothing, that's gonna develop arthritis very, very quickly, even if you go in and take it out. Now you've got a big pothole, basically, um, on the, you know, usually it's the medial femoral condyle, and then as you, you're going through range of motion, that very quickly wears out the cartilage in the rest of the knee. So that develops arthritis fairly quickly. The rates drop with surgeries to try to repair that lesion, but it probably does not drop it to zero. How likely you are to develop arthritis is probably is very likely dependent on what procedure was done to, you know, basically try to restore the articular surface and then how well did it actually do that? Is it 
Solid, is it smooth, meaning there's no one or two millimeter step off uh, between the normal cartilage and bone and the, the lesion or the, the implant if that was what's done. Uh, so the, the more normal the anatomy was recreated, then the lower the risk of arthritis, but it's probably not like it would be in an uninvolved knee that had an OCD lesion. Now, if you've followed me for any recent amount of time, you probably have heard me say, I don't routinely shut people down. This is not medical advice, but with my patients, I usually do not stop them from running. Now, maybe right after surgery, there's some exceptions to that. But even with an injury, I feel like the benefits of running, really the benefits of all kinds of exercise, outweigh the risk of potentially developing arthritis. And even that is somewhat debatable. Um, but having said that, uh, that's kind of how I feel. In this case, I'd say if it was one of my patients, yeah, I'd probably let that person run. But is the risk of arthritis there? Yes, possibly. All right, Kaylee coming in from South Africa. Thank you for joining. You may be the only person that's at least told me that uh, they're from South Africa. I've got people in Europe and a lot of different countries that watch this, so very excited to have you here. Georgia, speaking of somebody from another country, great to see you. Uh, Kaylee says, I subluxed my shoulder about a month ago. I only feel pain when I lift my arm. had a biceps tenodesis in 2018. Bi my biceps feels like it's slipping out of place. So that's an interesting thing, and those are almost, I'm trying to find my shoulder model here, oh, right in front of me, uh, two, almost two different problems. Um, so if you're looking at the shoulder head on, now the biceps tendon is not really shown here. These, this is the pec uh, major tendon, the rotator cuff tendons. Um, what you don't see is the biceps, which is a muscle on the, the top of the, or the front of the arm. It becomes a tendon that comes right across the top of the shoulder. Now, a biceps tenodesis can be done for several different reasons, but it, a lot, one of the common reasons is if there's some sort of injury to the ligament or the sheath that holds that biceps tendon in place, um, and it, if it is injured, that tendon can snap across the groove, the bicipital groove, and cause pain. And so a tenodesis would eliminate that uh, typically. So having uh, sub feelings of it slipping out of place after a biceps tenodesis would be kind of interesting. A shoulder, ah, sorry about that. A shoulder subluxation is like a dislocation where the ball slides out of the socket, but unlike uh, dislocation where it comes fully out of place, a subluxation sort of gets to the rim, if I can get this back on here, um, gets to the rim of the, now I'll do that later, of the uh, socket but doesn't completely pop out of place. Um, most of the time that doesn't end up needing surgery, but I've seen and I've had a number of patients uh, that I ended up having to do surgery because it was still unstable. The, the labrum, the cartilage bumper around the socket was pulled off just enough. The capsule that surrounds the socket was pulled off just enough. Or I'm sorry, the capsule that surrounds the socket was stretched out or torn enough that there wasn't enough stability. So usually with an isolated subluxation, aggressive physical therapy, strengthening all the muscles around the shoulder, a lot of them do well. But occasionally, unfortunately, that does end up needing surgery. Um, that is funny. So, Georgia, I did know you were from Greece. I did not know you're South African. Maybe you uh, and Kaylee can uh, connect. That's really cool. Mary, uh, grinding my shoulders for two months. Doc said, rotator cuff tendonitis, inflammation, bursitis, cortisone shot because of the pain. Yeah, I know. Mary, you and I have talked uh, on this show a fair number of times, uh, and I don't know all the ins and outs of what that shoulder looks like. So, again, not medical advice. I'm not a huge cortisone fan for rotator cuff impingement, um, what we used to call tendonitis or bursitis. Um, if there's a bursitis there, yes, it might help, but the, the cortisone and the steroid have some negative effects on the rotator cuff tendons, make them weaker, make them more likely to tear. Maybe somebody would get away with one. I certainly would have reservations about more than one, but if it's my shoulder uh, and I'm older than a lot of my patients now, I would uh, not get one myself uh, for rotator cuff impingement. That's something typically physical therapy uh, and some other things can be helpful to, to try. Somebody asked me the other day about peptides for rotator cuff impingement. Certainly could be possible uh, that that could be helpful. Um, I've, I've struggled with how peptides might work with a problem inside of a joint like the knee, like the shoulder, without injecting it into the joint, having a physician do that. But potentially that is something that, that could be possible. Um, 
Fortunately, rotator cuff impingement is not something that typically needs surgery. Um, and yes, yeah, she said bursitis and then PT later. Um, Oh, yeah, I think, I mean, again, not medical advice. I'm, I'm a big fan of physical therapy. I think that can be very, very helpful for lots of problems, especially for rotator cuff or shoulder impingement. All right, thank you so much for joining us. I think that's all the questions I got. I'm really uh, happy uh, two people from South Africa here. That's very, very cool. I hope you have an amazing weekend. Next month, the Ask Dr. Guy Live is going to be a little bit earlier because the last Friday in November is the day after Thanksgiving, which is a holiday for just about everybody here in the United States, so it'll be a week early. But I very, very much look forward to seeing you there. Make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I record a couple of videos a week on all different kinds of injuries, so I'd love for you to check those out. Thanks so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Take care.